All right, uh, so I'll get the session started. Right, it's um, CXL uh, development discussion points, and uh, you know a little bit of background. Right, I did see some of the discussion on the tiering side, and I was trying to avoid all of that, to be honest, and kind of focus on some low-level parts of the stack here. Right, you know, tiering is a part of all of this, right? But we also have driver development and. Uh, memory reliability issues that are trying to be faced in the CXL world uh, in terms of like what was built into the spec and what we're starting to see. And so I wanted to touch base on some of those points and show how uh, development efforts in CXL actually transfer over to other subsystems. And so, you know, the, there's another side to CXL. <clears throat> so my first uh, sort of ask, right, and this has come up several times. So. One thing I think it's good for people to know is that uh, you know there's a Discord server, and I think it's managed by Dan, right? The, the, and we do have um, discussion on that Discord server. There's monthly meetings that we have as well where we discuss CXL-related issues. And one of the things that I've noticed, and it was like explicitly called out about having more reviews on, on patches, and so one thing I was, I'm trying to get people who may, may be interested, and maybe I'll show some more reasons why, but you know, tiering is very exciting, but we also want to make sure that we have like a robust driver underneath all of this as well. And uh, e even internally, right, uh, uh, from Samsung, we're interested in driving some features related to our hardware as well, and it can be hard to sort of coordinate all of this, but uh, one thing that was been really nice uh, recently is that, uh, I think there's a, a new thing is um, using patchwork. So the CXL development is starting to use patchwork. And so now you can see patches queued up and how many reviews they have, things like that, for people to kind of get a jumping in point. Right? I think that was one of the feedback that we hear from a lot of people is like, OK, you guys are running forward with this. Uh, how do we even get involved? And where's a good point to start? And I always tell people always reviews are, are one of the most important things. And uh, you know, through the discussion that was recently had, you know, let us know through the mailing list if anything should be queued. So, Another thing, uh, uh, I was talking with an attendee here, and he was mentioning how he's doing a lot of work in PCIe for uh, unrelated use case. But I told him, is, you know, if you're interested in this area and you're starting to look a little bit more, PCIe knowledge is just very, very beneficial in CXL, right? By the way that the PCIe hierarchy, you uh, program what's called root decoders, and you have to walk the hierarchies and more and more functionality is being tied to, to port level. So this is just very um, valuable for uh, the, I, I would believe, the community in general, right? Start looking more at the PCIe pieces that are shared, right, in some places there. And one of the things I wanted to point up, but I haven't seen much from, and maybe Dan, I don't know if you've seen this either, the port for port devices, the uh, RAS support for CXL and I think AMD, Talked about this at Plumbers. I couldn't find anything on the list yet. I don't know if I don't know if anyone's seen anything or um, that that work is, is is still in still in progress. But it it's interesting because you know PCI's knowledge is, is really useful, especially because now um, uh, CXL basically makes your your PCI device your memory controller, and and but when but we still need to contend with PCI error handling and, and all of these things. Um, but yeah, the, the, that patch in particular is also running into the fact that the, that PCIe has this concept called the the port driver, and that's where a uh, AR DPC these uh, these uh, PCI error events are reported, and that actually ended up with a a driver architecture that makes it really hard to add CXL specific things. So. so is the invitation for people with PCI core knowledge to get involved is useful because we're, yeah, we're, we're having to unwind some ways in which CXL is stressing out the PCI core. And, and, and this, this RAS support is in progress, but it's running up against that. Yeah, and I think the, the key thing was, right, they went with a service-based model, right, is that there's an owner, then you register a service, uh, and that, that was the model that worked well, yeah, and, and you know, yeah, just any kind of limits to that for this use case, yeah, it would be great to kind of work this out. Um, related to that, that I, I thought was quite quite interesting. So it, one one area that, that we are uh, you know so reliability and serviceability in general, and internally I've been kind of pushing to have us work more and look across uh, subsystems that are dealing with memory errors in general, right? Like I was saying, let's look at EDAC, let's do because we see it coming for CXL as well, 
And well, one thing that, that came up recently, right, was um, how to deal uh, with poison. So if I take a step back, right, and this goes back to Dan's comment about memory controller being on the device. So uh, the device can interrupt the host and, allow, and tell it about events that have happened or events that have seen that the device is aware of. One of them being that the device has found poison, like a, a device physical address that, that should be poisoned now and shouldn't be used. And I, I found this discussion interesting. So one of the first, like the first patch, the part of it is like a, a cleanup for address translation between the device physical address and the host physical address. And that was picked up. And I like to encourage this kind of work, like even looking in new functionality, when it starts pulling out pieces that can be used generally, I think it's a really good thing, right? Even though the second part of this is a little bit more controversial. And then I'll, I'll, I'll kind of pull that up on the next slide. And uh, so I have a quote from Dan, you know, <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> and it has a typo, but it, I just pulled it as is. But yeah, what, what, and this is, again, I've heard several people here that I've talked to, and it is, I think it's a very accurate description. Like memory controller, you know, Dan said to PCIe, you know, sometimes from a device vendor we say it's moving towards the device, right? You know, like that boundary is very blurred, right? But it's clearly not part of the CPU itself, right? This memory controller uh, responsibility, right? It, it interacts with it. And because this is happening, what I am seeing personally, like beyond uh, the, the company I work for, right, is a push for this differentiated memory. And what does that mean, right? So I think there were good examples when we were having the tiering discussion about a second NUMA node and having a uh, different higher latency or whatever, maybe like that can be a way of approximating it. But you know, there are, there's memory with different bandwidth characteristics, right? You know, there's HPM memory that's tied to CPUs and can be exposed as a NUMA node. Um, you know, error handling in general, right? You, know, you might have memory with, with more potential for uh, error issues. Uh, we have an upcoming talk about uh, a device that has uh, compressed memory as well and how to expose it, right? So it does open up the possibilities of what you could do with memory. Right? I'm not here to debate whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, but it's just clear of where people are taking it. So um, I think the, the key thing right here on this poison event, event handling, and uh, I, I would say is like I, I see the, I'm, I agree the same way right, with this poison event handling, right? is that, so again, the device can send events, right? Like that's the basic model of the driver that it works is that it, it, you, you pull for these events or they can be interrupted and then you see this event related to the media and then what do you do with it? So currently, and actually this is a question for Dan, right, is that um, when I looked at this and you know, I, don't, I didn't compare everything, but when I look at EDAC, right, it basically does some things very similar to the CXL driver, right, in terms of like reporting out some memory related events. And, you know, as we're looking, you know, we're trying to say like, should EDAC be the one that does that? Or what was different in the CXL case? Like, I, I did not look at those patches when they first came, but why was there a push for the CXL to have its own events and then like RAS daemon to understand the CXL ones versus piggybacking off of what was there for EDAC? I, I'd be very curious about that. Well, so let me, so step back to the history of EDAC. So EDAC was a subsystem that was invented basically to understand all the different kind of architecture-specific uh, memory controller layouts and how to extract error information out of the the Intel memory controller versus the IBM thing versus the whatever. So so it's it's basically trying to wrap some commonality across a whole bunch of different things, um, and then CXL is to me is is kind of the uh, a standardization of that. So now, now rather than teaching an EDAC to understand everybody's memory controller, we teach Linux to just understand CXL, mm. and then now harder people are are responsible for making their hardware look like CXL. Um, but but we're kind of in this in between stage right now where the CXL driver knows how to do its native its native CXL events. And we have EDAC that knows how to tell RAS daemon about memory errors in, in a generic way. So what we're working on now is, take, should, is taking the, the CXL events, translating them to EDAC to try to get um, uh, the benefit of RAS daemon already knowing how to, how, how to, har how to harvest those errors. Um, 
uh, yeah. Yes, so. yes, so if it's correct that my assumption now is that uh, RAS daemon was changed to understand the CXL events well, that were output well, at the moment. Th that, I think I think that's what we don't want. Like, okay. I mean, okay. I, I know some people added. They said, "Oh, let's 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 teach RAS daemon about CXL events." Like, I think there's there's value in the fact that you can have a legacy existing RAS daemon that knows how to check for corrected memory errors and be like, you know what? Um, it, has, it has a, le a leaky bucket algorithm that says, too many corrected errors in this, in, in this physical address, take the page offline. Mm -hmm. And that's something, that, that's something that, that can be generically done for, for any memory. And we kind of don't want to re teach it to do the exact same thing with some CXL specific event. Okay. Um, so for some of those cases where there's existing RAS daemon value to, to harvest, I think we should translate those into events that RAS daemon already understands. But then we can also backfill it with 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 new CXL specific things, if, if there's if there's value there. But like, yeah, I, I basically I don't want to teach RAS daemon a different way to do the exact same thing. It already, yeah. it already knows how to do with an EDAC yeah. event. Yeah, definitely, I, I'm I'm on the same boat, right? If EDAC already covers the same use cases CXL is trying to achieve, but just through a different interface, you sh we should just merge the two in some way, right? So I think we'll actively be looking in this space and trying to help out in this space. But yes, and, and I think yeah, Dan's uh, response on the mailing list is spot on, right? There's different actors that can be informing the OS about memory errors, and yeah, there should be commonality. And yeah, and it's clear that this patch didn't uh, look at all these different options, but I think it's nice that we started discussing it, right? And it was definitely on our radar too, as well, like from our viewpoint of what we're looking at. And so uh, I think there's some momentum behind here. Um, well, the, the other thing, right? Oh, go for I'll, it. I'll, I'll, I'll point out a, f a funny uh, something you found here is like, so if, if you're not familiar with these acronyms about ACPI, GHES, and these other things, there, these memory errors can be either reported to the OS directly or they can be reported to your BIOS first so that it can do something and log in some system log and then uh, your platform specific log and then, and then tell the OS about it later. But one of the funny or not funny things we found was that for some of these protocol errors, if it goes to the BIOS first, when it tells the OS, it says, hey, OS, here's a, you got a, a, a critical error, uh, the next thing the kernel does is panic. Because uh, it tells it like G there's a GHCH panic uh, uh, form. Oh. Oh right. Oh, um, just a conceptual problem. This is a daemon, right? And as it's a daemon, it's running in memory. And we are just trying to figure out memory errors. What if the memory error is on that page where the daemon is running on? I mean, a lot of these uh, RAS events are like opportunistically trying to get you some some forensic information, if possible. But yeah, so but if if you get a memory error that that kills RAS daemon, you don't you don't get to know you about. You don't that. get anything to do with. So, question remains: Do we see any error then, or do we see anything if we, if that happens to kill the RAS daemon? Um, it, it, the the answer is it depends. Like so. For for me, like I I like I don't like the fact that BIOS gets uh, first crack at these things, and oh, and I like the OS native because I'm a kernel developer. I, I like to be I like to work on kernel things, and so I like that the OS gets first crack at these things. The problem is, is that uh, then it's then it's susceptible to, to RAS daemon getting impacted. For these firmware first things, at least if like let let's say it was it's, it's not about firmware first. It is just the whole so the conceptual thing. So. Do we see anything if the Rust is killed? Um, when you access, right, I think this is the different question, right? It's like the latent error here, right? So you would see the machine check exception when you actually access the memory poison, right? So Raz Damon, right. I think, is looking at um, non, it's like hot path information. Like corrected uh, errors, uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, errors that were corrected, things like this, right? So yeah, so then once you actually try to access the memory, then that would be the machine check exception and would be handled differently. Right, yeah, yeah, so yeah, we, I, yeah, we, we should talk about what error we're talking about. We're talking about like a system fatal event, we might not get anything, versus like a, uh, a poison cache line, then we get a local machine check, and, and that could get, that could be recoverable. So there's a there's an entire spectrum of you get nothing to you get very precise error information, depending on the error. But but the but the discrepancy I, I, I found was that 
some of these errors are reported. The first thing the colonel, it tells the colonel to do is, is panic. You had a fatal error. If, if we're not talking to the BIOS first and PCI gets it first, PCI error recovery will go through the end. And at the bottom, there's a nice comment that says, to do, should we panic? Question <laughs> mark. And, and, and so it, we, it's an opportunity, opportunity to clean up that consistency, have some consistency between those two things. Yeah, and you know, uh, from a Samsung perspective, right, uh, uh, we see this in another place, right? It was in the Designware uh, PCIe controller, right? They were facing the same thing. There's another Samsung team in a different uh, division, and they were trying to make sense of this uh, PCIe ports that have like PMU information as well as error injection capabilities. And they were like, what do we do, right? How do we handle this? Who's responsible for what? And so, you know, some of the same things, and then basically the response was, have, why don't you put it in an EDAC, right? At least the error ejection path. But well, then it was kind of quiet on there, right? And so that's one thing, you know, our team might try to help out a little bit with, right? Is like trying to make sense of uh, how to put these all together, right? In some common way. But yeah, we see it within a company too, right? In multiple places other than just CXL. I think that's, that's one thing I'd like to take away from the talk. I'm not talking about this just because of CXL either, right? It's like coming from platforms there, there's something happening about, you know, memory that uh, has more error prone that's coming from more angles than just CXL. Yeah, like a, another, another recent uh, development here was uh, folks are trying to define a new memory scrub subsystem. And this is so that you can control the scrubbing rate of your, of your memory. Um, and it basically, it basically becomes a, uh, uh, a trade off between how much performance you want to give up for scrubbing and to, to keep your system up and running versus <coughs> would you be willing to scrub less to get more performance but maybe, maybe incur more memory errors. And uh, some, some environments want to be able to control that scrub rate. There's an ACPI mechanism to do this. There's a CXL mechanism to do this. And so, uh, and what we've, and, and what the memory scrub people found going upstream was that there's actually a whole bunch of different EDAC ways to do it as well. So it, it's been a, we're, basically we're, 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 from the CXL side, we're stum stumbling on the fact that people have been kind of independently solving problems and not, uh, and maybe not in ways that we could do better if we all work together more closely. Oh yeah, you, you have the scrub thing right there. Yep. Yeah, definitely. From you. <laughs> yeah. But oh, and then you know, I think one other interesting thing, right, about piggybacking CXL support. Again, you know, from a device vendor uh, uh, look, look at it. So one of the things that CXL supports is called Get Set Features, and it's a way for you to figure out from the device what features it supports. And one of the features happens to be scrub control. All right. And so for us, when we look at this and we say, hey, this has the Get Set Feature support. We're excited, right? Definitely, right? And, and definitely on the whole RAS side, we're excited as well too, right? So it's kind of aligning perfectly for us about practical things that we would see. And so, uh, you know, we're just very happy to see this work. But yeah, we've definitely noticed that the problem now is not really CXL. It's about integrating in a bigger picture, right? For at least these pieces so far that I'm bringing up. And uh, uh, the other one, I have not looked at the AMD one, and then you, you brought that up as well in the discussion, so I think the only thing that it does is report but poison memory, very similar, like having a poison list I think you mentioned. So again, another source, right? And that's their memory controller from their memory con M1300, I don't know what that no, is. No, that's, that's their AI accelerator, and, oh, and, okay. and, uh, and as far as I understand, it, 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 it can reach keep a persistent list of memory poison locations so the next time you boot up, you can be like, hey, don't test those pages again because we know, we know they're bad. Um, but yeah, but that's, and there's a similar CXL command for this. Um, the, other, the other piece of this for, and we, and we kind of started this on the, in, the, in the PMEM space, is that these technologies have a way to repair errors as well. Mm -hmm. Typically, uh, memory poison and these memory failures have been kind of permanent events, like never touch that page again. Mm -hmm. but. Uh, but you can you can scrub the error and and, and sometimes get, get the page back and um, uh, we're kind of we don't have a comprehensive way to 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 tell people or to yes to, to go back and forth we we do it with uh, with file systems and, and PMEM because we we can deallocate uh, that physical page and, and 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 bring it back in but there's no kind of generic way that the that the like like the page allocator could figure out oh hey. I can send this. Um, I can send this page off to be repaired, okay. and bring it back. 
I, th I think it's hilarious that the, the, the memory vendors aren't learning from the disk manufacturers. Do, do, do you remember like 30, 40 years ago when hard drives used to come with a, a list of sectors yeah, yeah, that were yeah, bad yeah, yeah. and, and the file system has this bad blocks thing you can use to map them out? Pretty much same thing, yeah, same concept. And, and, and now I, we don't do that anymore. <laughs> well, I'm going to claim innocence and say it's someone else pushing. <laughs> we do what they want. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so yeah, but, but I understood, right? Yeah, so it's, I just think this is happening beyond CXL. I think it's the most important thing to kind of think about here too as well. That, that's the world uh, as it's evolving. Oh, but, but to, to your point, Willie, really, the, 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 the reason that went away because the drives just got much better at, at not reporting poison. It's like, no, 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 no. no. no they, they, they have extra space, and they map that stuff out, and then they use they use other blocks to, to get rid of this, right? Like they have, there's, it's under provision. Oh, okay, so this, 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 okay, so this was this was pre pre bad blocks drives that couldn't map it out and put it somewhere else. That don't they didn't remap sectors to say. Yeah, before we had like spare capacity on drives. Okay, yeah. All right. So one thing that I wanted to bring up, right, and uh, I, I enjoyed this discussion on the tiering too, right, was the whole benchmarks, right? And uh, I, I think it would be nice when we're having tiering discussions, and I don't know if this is possible, if there was like some configuration, it's hard with different, you know, server platforms, all these different things, but, you know, if there was like some agreement of like, there's these three workloads that we're willing to run and just kind of see if you see any regressions. Uh, and my comment on there too, right, is like, I, I know in the call there was like, there was a, a ask for the whole group about workloads we're interested in. And you know, like we've looked at Redis in memory databases, different things like this, but as a device vendor, in my personal opinion, right, is that I'm not the most valuable person to be benchmarking, right, or, or to be providing information about benchmarks. Of course, we're interested in running it and understanding more, but I'm not the end workload user, right? And, and I think that's the key person that really should be giving us that information if possible. And I know there's some venues f uh, uh, for this, right? And um, one is the, the o OCP is a venue that I do see some uh, potential overlap here, right, of them, them providing benchmarks as well. Like, the, you know, they have this uh, composable memory systems work stream, but not all of it will be directly relevant, right? You know, it's, it's, it's more of like something more broad and more general, but there are some goals within that work stream to work on getting uh, traces. And then th that brings up another thing that, about CXL, right, is that uh, OCP was a forum for interested parties to come up with a model of a CXL device that uh, compresses memory. Right, so this was driven uh, by, by, I think Meta and Google are the primary authors on there as well. And so you see these things coming from a variety of sources, right? And, and uh, what, what I'm trying to tell people, right, you know, I look at it from a memory expander viewpoint, but there are many different use cases and CXL is a potential way to do many of these things, right? It's just the flexibility of moving the memory controller. And, uh, you know, that tiering working group, uh, I think it's a great venue and I, I really, like, I think we, we will have members hopefully being involved in it, right, and, and contributing. And um, yeah, that's it, right? And, but I was going to ask, like, isn't this a general like, like touching the MM is hard, it, it, without with, even with, even without making CXL part of it, in the, in the sense of uh, people proposing MM change, MM changes, generally, are not sure what what workloads they're regressing. It's not until like Mel at Suse runs his. Yeah. And talks to his customers, be like, "Oh no, you you regress this very well, important I, use case." I saw it more systematic, right? And it, you know, I'm not at Susa, right? But you know, we 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 chat, and and we've got some legacy from there. And you know, there's like, uh, was it uh, MM test, right? Uh, which out of there, right? And I think there were some like benchmarks worth running, right? And configurations that were reproducible from there that that were donated in some way, right? Like that was given, right? And and he said, here, I ran this benchmark here. I think he was like great at that and more than many other people uh, for my, like I felt like I could reproduce some of that, right? And I feel that that's lacking a lot of times, right? And, and you know, it's just kind of my, my hope, right? I'd love to see one of these tiering patches and an associated workload. I could just go run and check it out, right? At the same time, 
So, but you know, that's kind of the, the, the way we see it. And then, yeah, I, I'm very curious, right, if I hear, don't hear anybody using HBM that much, right? And I know it's a small use case, you know, where the large use case is, right? But I do know, like, if you uh, look up, like, basically kind of, to, to me, it's like a, a PMEM kind of thing. Like, HBM can be used as caches or it can be exposed as a NUMA node. And I would imagine people using those systems might uh, want some sort of tiering or some, some, something there, right? You know, it's very, I, I haven't seen anything, though. Um I'm, I'm not. Sure, I mean, maybe somebody else could speak up. And, and this is this is just my this is a, my personal opinion. But it, yes. it feels like the people that pay for HBM want the kernel to get out of the way. Okay. Uh, and so, and so, so, so they, they don't come to us and say like, hey, your, your Luma balancing is not working for <laughs> HBM because they've turned everything off and they've allocated HBM onto their own special thing. That's fair. I know. I know one user like that. Right. Yeah. Super computing kind of thing. Right. Yeah. They run one workload and they know exactly what they're doing. So yeah, I think that's consistent. So. Um, the last thing, you know, we're kind of running out of time, and this is super challenging, but we've briefly discussed this. So internally, we've been trying to think of a baseline, and we haven't been good at it. I'll, I'll be completely honest, right? Because it changes so fast, right? Like what's in CXL, what's supported, uh, the emulation of it, right? So there's um, QMU, uh, there's CXL test, there was some user space tooling proposed, but, you know, it's just moving very fast and then that makes it very hard to settle on what should be a baseline but you know i would say is that um, we should leverage what's currently there if more than one v vendor of say cpus devices would be willing to donate some hardware and m now might not be the time right it's a little bit early but at some point i think it'd be great to somehow have a central place where we could report information about devices and CPUs, right? Like, if anyone was willing to donate this, I, I know it's a, kind of complicated. We have had success allowing people to use some hardware that we have, but I, I can see the resistance from some people because it's a little bit scary saying like, hey, I'm gonna access this machine provided by Samsung, right? Like, you know, it's like just one person. And so somehow trying to wrap this into some envelope where people trust it more, right? And that it won't go away would be nice. But yeah, where do you host it? What tests do you run? How do you present data? And so I think this is being talked about in many subsystems. And you know, where we provide hardware is in these co-location centers and it costs money, right? The, the, to just have it in there. Then there's the money for the hardware. So, you know, there's there's all these things here and you know, I don't know the I know the value for the there's several parties I know that there would be value, right? And but I don't know whether they're willing to kind of pitch in on these kind of efforts. That's the hard part, right? But anyways, you know, then the dream world, I'd love to see this. So I think that's kind of all that I have. Any mm -hmm. so that does sound like a good idea. Um, so Adam and I were talking about this earlier, but uh, we're also a memory vendor, and uh, uh, our team is trying to figure out how to contribute more, and stumbling a little bit to try to figure out what to do. And uh, so this is a sort of now or later offer. In the specific, it's we're interested in assignments. Uh, you know, tell us what you need. We know what mailbox commands we need to enable and stuff, and there's some patches pushed for that. Uh, but if we could figure out a sort of shared wish list, to-do list kind of thing, or if you can just reach out to me and I'll connect with the people, we'll, we'll try to help with that. And of course it's challenging because some of them are on the opposite side of the earth, uh, which makes things like the monthly sync difficult. Well, my, my, my suggestion, the, the patchwork I think will help in my opinion. Because right? you can like see it, yeah. where there's no reviews, right? And something that's queued up. When I work uh, internally, the first thing I ask people to do is review. Right, and then kind of build from there, and I, I think that's a great start. And then there's a lot of stuff in the RAS stuff, right, related, right, like that's unsolved, and someone just needs to get in there and kind of figure these things out too, as well. But anyway, you know, but uh, I think it's hard to coordinate, that's the hardest part, right? I don't know what Dan has thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, it's oh, uh, it's the it's it's but, but that that's also kind of like a general problem. Like how do people get involved in the kernel? How do they mm -hmm. find find things to work on and, and on a per, per subsystem basis? Um, but but we should pu publicize the publish publicize the Discord more. I, I feel I feel like some I feel like people will use that more than the lists for kind of those 
um, those flyby questions where it's like I, I don't, I don't want to send it to a, a global email list. Um, so that might be a good a good place to, to ask these things. Um, but yeah, the a lot of the a lot of these kind of there's the, there's no grand vision, and a lot of these and a lot of these uh, work tasks just pop up out of, coming from review or coming from people having having pain points. So yeah, if we just if we, if we just coordinate more on what those pain points are and who's who's not look, who's not looking at them and, and, yeah. and the, we can people can grab grab things. Yeah, the Discord server is great because there's history there, but at the same time, time consuming to consume the history. So yeah. So one of the things about the the hardware and getting people to donate hardware. I mean, you, you have both the CPU side, but then you also have the device side, right? Mm -hmm. And who's who's building devices with which IPs mm -hmm. out there? And there's limited things, so I don't know how many connections you guys have with like the RAM buses or the you know the Intels or the synopsises of the world that have CXL IPs, or if someone has a homegrown IP that they're using in a device, and yeah. how do you get them all to be compliant? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Um yeah, we're, we're, you know, Samsung's a big company, right? We have connections to many different places, right? But, uh, you know, from a device perspective, right, from the, the memory expander device, you know, I see that as the most near term, right? And that, you know, well, you know given enough time, right, that, you know, that should be more generally available, right? And so, yeah, you know, I think it's not around the corner, right? You know, just put it at that, right? But, you know, it's like the little bit of the chicken and egg problem. Once the servers are more widely available, then I uh, imagine the device is coming out more broadly too as well, right? And, you know, there's been a little bit of a resistance to uh, the first generation of CXL with limited capabilities, right? You know, everyone's like, eh, you know, it's kind of limited <laughs> in some ways, right? Like, I understand the, the benefits of it too as well, right? As like prototyping plan and figuring things out, but yeah, so it's a little chicken and egg problem right now. But my gut kind of sensing is this will be worked out more, right? you know, from our team perspective, uh, we would say is that, you know, we've had more hardware in the past year than previously, if that makes sense, in our hands that we're working with, right? And so it's definitely around the corner. Yeah. Well, that's it. All right, well, thanks for your time. <laughs>